Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to Build. I am your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is one of my favorite actors right now. He's been in shows like Boardwalk Empire, Sweet Bitter, House of Cards, movies like Midnight Special, Mud, and Thoroughbreds. And now you can see uh, Paul Sparks in season two of Stephen King in J.J. Abrams' Castle Rock. Let's take a look. Everybody, please welcome Paul Sparks. Sir, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I believe you've been here before. This is my first time interviewing you, I think. I believe this is my second time being here. Maybe third. Not being interviewed by me, then. Never. Yes. And I'm a big fan of yours. As I told you in the green room, I saw you do uh, an Edward Albee play uh, mm -hmm. at Signature, was it? Or was it? Yeah, good? it was a Signature, yeah. And uh, blew my fucking mind. Tore me apart. You were incredible. It's a good, good play. It's a long monologue. It's a long monologue, <laughs> and you were all over the stage illustrating every detail of the monologue mm -hmm. in gestic with wild gesticulations. So much gesticulating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but let's, uh, let's first talk about Castle Rock a little bit. Um, you get to play uh, someone a little creepy, creeping around, lurking. Yeah. Uh, how did this come to you? You know, it, like many of these things do, you know, it's like it just kind of popped up in, the, in my inbox window and was like, hey, do you want to look at this and see if this might be something that would be right for you? And uh, and it was, I, 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 I'd never really done anything that was so, um, like Stephen King's such a huge part of the kind of literary tapestry of, of, uh, of our lives. And so it seemed sort of cool mm -hmm. and a little daunting to, to be a part of something that he was doing. And then I watched the first season and I thought, oh, wow, they make this look really good. This is like good. This show's creepy and and good, but they pick good actors and oh, yeah. the scripts are good and uh, uh, the cast so, in this season is incredible. Yeah, yeah, like, and all and, around, and it, they add more as the season progresses. Yeah, I, I, it, it's been a really like awesome uh, experience. Um, I've never really done like too much horror. I think maybe you know the first cruddy movie I ever made, you know, the indie film I made was probably horror. What was it? I, 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 what was it called? It was called uh, Headspace. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, anyway. Wait, what was your part <laughs> no, in Headspace? No. You know, Here I was the go, guy, Paul. no, in, in Headspace, I play the character that's not the bad guy. He's kind of the dick. Can you say that? Yeah. You probably can't say that. Sure. Yeah, yeah um, and uh, he's the one that's like, why is everybody running around? Right, like, right. what's going on? Why is everybody so sweaty and he upset? He gets his head cut off? And then he, like, turns into a monster and, like, rips someone in half. <laughs> like, that's what, that's, what I, that's what I did. What I like about uh, your performance in Castle Rock, and this is, I mean, in juxtaposition with uh, something like, um, or not comparing it, but with something like Zoo Story where you are gesticulating wildly, in this, it is all about reservation and holding it back. Your creepiness and your power comes from saying very little and moving very little and kind of owning the space around you. When did you come up with that for the character? Or was that sort of in, was that in the script? Well, I think that you're all, I mean, look, we, whenever you're dealing with the sort of the supernatural, I think that you have to kind of define what the rules are, like what's going on inside that mm -hmm. thing that you're being. And so some of it came from there and sort of the, the, uh, Dustin uh, Thomason, who who wrote it, talked to me a little bit about the history. I knew a little bit at the beginning of where this guy came from and who he was and how he was sort of interacting with the ace, you know, the other guy, and, like, how they uh, were together. And so some of those things really informed it. But I think, too, that the the mood of the way they wanted to go about the sort of this, the scariness of him was a kind of stillness and a sort of um, mystery like you don't you can't figure out exactly what's going on and so in a way it's like you don't want to gesticulate too much because you don't want to give anything away well also because what he becomes is completely different from what he starts the show as correct which is like I mean he becomes that thing very within by the second episode he right. his change yeah. happens yeah and the first episode is ace is like a lunkhead you know he's just like an absolute you know simple person like, you know, i'm mad at that let's drive into he's it. yeah he's very basic yeah. you know he wants to hit hit things <laughs> you know with his fists and um this other guy is not like that he's much more cerebral and uh i think the two of them are interacting a little bit inside of me but that ultimately uh yeah what 
sort of added to the creepiness of him was uh, he's sort of lurking in the in the background, and when you do see him, you're not sure exactly what is going on, right. you know. And I think that that was that. So it worked to my advantage to sort of be in that place. That's what it felt right. Well, I think that you're, uh, and uh, try to say this without spoiling anything. I think the, only the first four episodes are, are are up online. But the way that you are behaving and performing Ace after the change also informs how everybody else who is a part of that world is behaving and, 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 and performing their characters as well. Does that make sense? Like, you're the first that we see, right? and everybody else has to kind of take your cue. Yeah, they have to do what I do. <laughs> they had the fun. They Did you had know no, that? They had no choice. Did you know that? Was that talked about at all? No, or was like no I mean, well, yeah, uh, a little bit. I mean, I think that initially, you know, we would have people on the show who were playing those parts that they were going through a change, and they would come to me and say, so... What are you doing? So what are you, what's going on? Like, what, what are you doing? So, yeah, I kind of, I would say, well, I'm, uh, I'm doing this. And they would say, okay, we'll approximate that. Well, it makes sense, though, because the whole idea is to be inconspicuous. Right. He talks about that. Right. I think that, I mean, look, this is one of the great things about Stephen King. When he has these, they're like virus, you know, that sort of are infiltrating our everyday lives. They're like sneaking out and trying to like be amongst us. That there is a certain amount of like, don't be noticed, yeah. don't be seen, fit in, you know, uh, but just be a little off, you know, because we are making a television show. So, and they are off. The characters are, are off. They're, off. A, they're a little bit off. Yeah. Um, when did you? How did you're from Oklahoma? How did you start acting? What happened? What happened to you? Uh, <laughs> man, I don't, I don't. That's a long, that's a, that's a long interview. Um, no, I, I grew up in Oklahoma, a really small town. My parents are school teachers. You know, they taught at like little tiny schools. A couple of them. My father was a high school football coach, and did you uh, play? I did. I did play football and baseball and basketball, and that was like what we did. But in order to pad my uh, college resume, I got involved with the theater department <laughs> at my high school, um, which was very small. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was kind of doing it, it seemed I had somewhat of an aptitude, at least in comparison to a lot of the other people that were doing it at my school. And so, and I enjoyed it. Like, I thought it was fun. I never really took it very seriously. And I went to, I got into Oklahoma State University and um, wanted to go study chemical engineering. And so I was planning on doing that. And my drama teacher said to me, hey, you know, they have a theater scholarship at Oklahoma State. And all you have to do is a monologue. And I happen to know a monologue. And she said, you'll get a day off of school if you want to go and audition for it. And so I was like, that sounds great. And so I did. And I'm not sure how many people auditioned uh, to get that scholarship. I do you remember what small. monologue it was? Um, <laughs> I, I do. It actually, it was two. It was it was a two part monologue. There was a there was a comedy and a tragedy. Okay. And so the comedy was a was a one called it's called Ema Dream, Y M A Ema like Ema Sumac and it's it's a dream. This is the funny one. It's about a uh, <laughs> it's about it's about a guy who has a dream that he's throwing a cocktail party, and everyone that shows up at his party uh, has names like Ema and Udo and. Uh, he has to introduce them, according to Ema Sumac, who's the star patron of his... <laughs> I can't believe... Was I'm this, even a from, is this, this a, is real. Is this, this is from a, a real play, thing. or is this from like, no, I have no, like, I have no idea. monologues like, for teenagers? Maybe somebody just gave it to me. Okay. But Ema Sumac is obsessed, is obsessed and says, you must introduce everyone by their first name. So it's like, Ema, Uma, Uma, Ida, Ida. You know, it's like that. Yeah. Anyways, this is really terrible. So, the, <laughs> so I did that, and then I... I I, I really brought it home with Oedipus Rex. <laughs> Creon, you know, it's like my, <laughs> pull my eyes out. It's 17. How did you come to Oedipus Rex? <laughs> How anyone you does. Just needed a tr yeah. Yeah, just, <laughs> I need a, I need a break from that, <laughs> from that party. So you got there on the theater scholarship. Did you still plan to study chemical engineering? Yeah, I studied totally. That was the plan. Study and work for Halliburton. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, that was my plan. Because Halliburton was like 10 minutes away from my hometown. Um, 
And I went and I found out immediately that I was going to be a very average chemist. And the theater department was so much more interesting. The people, for me, it was just, I loved it. I loved building sets and, you know, you had, because I had the, uh, I had the scholarship, I had to audition for the plays, and we did like The Rainmaker and Oklahoma, and uh, and you you know, I got cast because there just weren't that many of us, and uh, uh, I f totally fell in love with it. And then I was there for a year, uh, I got asked to go do a, a show in Connecticut, I'd never left Oklahoma really in my life, I went to Connecticut, I did a play up there. There were a bunch of people from New York, and they were like, don't go back to Oklahoma. Come up here. Wow. Um, so the next year I spent sort of trying to figure out where I might transfer to. Initially, I thought I was just going to quit school and move to New York, and my dad was like, easy now. You've, <laughs> you've never been, son. And, um, and good dad. Good dad. And uh, then... He was very supportive, and I went and I auditioned. I got into a couple of schools, and one of them was NYU, and I transferred and went to NYU and studied theater and philosophy at their undergrad program there, and do you, like right up the street. Do you feel like, as much as you were going into chemical engineering, your dad was the football coach, do you feel like, were your parents shocked by this change of you sort of becoming in love with theater and studying philosophy, or was it something that they sort of knew was always in, in you and were kind of like, here it comes. I, you know, I'm, uh, that's a good question. I, I, think, I think that their expectation of what I might do with it um, was not what it was. I think they, I think, I mean, my father actually said to me as I was like struggling a little bit in chemistry, he said to me, you know, if you want to be an actor, you can do that. I mean, I think what he thought was I was going to teach speech at a small you know, high school in like right over the river from where we were and that I was going to be in the local, you know, arsenic and old lace. And what it ended up being was, you know, I'm going to move to New York and I'm not going to move back. I'm going to be there for the next 30 years and I'm, you know, I'm going to be a professional. I don't think they expected that. Was New, was, uh, was New York hard? Like after school, when you finished school, did you start booking jobs pretty quickly? Or oh no 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 I no no I never made any money. <laughs> <laughs> I I did downtown theater for the first 10, 15 years that I was here. I just I was struggling right on these streets um, when this was Tower Records. Like I was trying to figure out like how does a person survive? Mm -hmm. But it was fun, you know. It was like I couldn't imagine a different. A different life, yeah. What I mean, you were doing downtown theater then. Like, what playwrights were you were you starting to work with? Because you're fairly beloved, I think, with a lot of downtown playwrights and who are now Broadway playwrights in their own right. At right. This point. Yeah, like we were talking about Adam Rapp. Yeah. yeah Annie it, it, Baker. You know. Annie Baker. Yeah. You know, I there were some writers, um, Craig Wright, Adam Rapp, <laughs> that that were around, and I knew them, and I. Adam especially, I did a lot of his shows. Um, I always kind of attached myself to writers. I'm a, obsessed with like good writing. I mean, in terms of that Albee play, it's like what draws you to it is like, you know, Edward Albee f can write. And so can so could these other people. And that's really, I just kind of hitched my wagon to, to them in many ways. And I, I really credit them with keeping me around and um, give me an opportunity to work on stuff. So yeah, I mean, I was doing plays with Adam Rapp and no one saw them. Mm -hmm. You know, we were doing, or I, we were, I remember the first play I did with him was this play called Blackbird, which is one of my favorite plays that's ever been written. It's a little two-hander. And we did it over at this place called the Blue Heron, which is on 24th Street between Park Avenue and um, I don't know, nowhere over there. No one saw it audience of maybe 35 people could come in. And, you know, that really was, you know, that making 200 bucks a week, like that's how I lived for a long time hmm. in New York City. And you loved it, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah. It was good. I'm really proud of, I'm proud of that, that time in my life. When was it that you decided, I mean, when did you feel like, did, when did you figure out that you wanted to attach yourself to good writers, and when did you start understanding what good writing was? 
Like, were you a big reader growing up? Like, just, no. In fact, you know, I mean? reading in Oklahoma is kind of like when I was growing up, I can remember sort of having a sort of antagonistic yeah. relationship with people who read. Same. Like that they had time to read. You rich, you know, sort of East Coast, you know, erudite <laughs> elitists, and and. Uh, then I got to I got to New York and everybody was talking about stuff from books and I didn't know what they were talking about, and I I feel like I started to learn to read when I got here, you know, sort of as a young adult, and um, I think in terms of theater, I'm not very good when the writing is not good. There are people who can make bad writing seem pretty good. They're those kinds of actors. I'm not that kind of actor. Like, I think it's really, I think it's imperative that not only am I attached to, the, to, like, that I feel like there's something there, but that there is a density to, like, what writers are writing. Um, there's an, uh, a sort of an honesty to it that I think I, that speaks to me, and it makes me a, a better actor. And I think I realized that pretty early on. And and I was just drawn to it. You know, I'm, I, I, it turns me on, man. When I read something that somebody writes that's, that I like, am like, yes, that's, that's, that's who we are, you know, as, a peop as people. When I read something like that, it, it makes me crazy. Like, I, like, want to be around that. I want to, I want to tear that to pieces and figure out why those people are behaving the way, the way they're behaving. And so some of it is just like an attraction, you know, just sort of like a, a me at a bright light. You know, I just kind of followed it in that way. And they sort of allow it. Because, you know, writers are typically sort of live alone and don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> you know, so if they have like a... You want to be my friend? Like, <laughs> if they have like a yes man, you know, like a, a, a person that just follows them around and talks about how great they are, they love it. <laughs> They're like, I'll cast you. Yeah. Um, you know, you also develop relationships like that with with filmmakers, right? I mean, Jeff Nichols, you've done with three three films with mm, now, three or four. Yeah. Jeff, and yeah, the music and he, video, he, which I love yeah, that music video. Yeah, he the, for his brother's band. Yeah, Jeff is a good friend. I still talk to him, um, and he's from Arkansas, and so he and I have a lot in common in terms of like who we are and where we're from, and um, yeah, I. I feel like that uh, that's part of my relationship to the business. I I I I'm I attach I want to be attached that when I when I when I really believe in like what somebody's doing or I really like what they're doing, then I follow them around. You know, I I'm, I want to know what they're up to, and uh, I've been really fortunate that a lot of them have have wanted something wanted me to be around too and so yeah. um your big break for lack of a better way of putting it would you say kind of came with boardwalk empire sir uh, definitely what was that what was the audition process like for that and follow that up with what was it like working with 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 terrence who's i, I and for my money one of the great writers working right now yeah you know uh that was crazy and i was actually doing um uh i was doing a really infamous had a gabbler on Broadway at that time with Mary Louise Parker, and um, yeah, that was I was not reviewed well, uh, and I looked like a um, uh, like one of the three Musketeers, and um, I had auditioned on tape for for Boardwalk Empire, and then they said you're going to get an audition maybe six or seven months later, and I showed up at the audition, and it was just me and. Martin Scorsese and Taren, Terry Winter and um, Ellen Lewis, the casting director, and that was it. And I went in and sort of did what I do on the show, which is the kind of crazy voice and all that stuff. And it was funny because, uh, well, first Scorsese and I talked about Ibsen for a long time because he's, oh, wow. yeah, so we talked about Ibsen and talked about him and I don't know. Norway. I, you know, it was, it was a crazy conversation. And then I did it, and I left, and I thought it went okay. And Ellen came out, and she said, hey, can you come back in and audition again? But this time, don't do, you know, don't talk, and just be yourself. Just do it the way you sound, do it. So I did it. It was awful. It was just terrible. It was <laughs> so bad. I just, 
I was so humiliated almost doing it, just sitting in a chair across. I mean, he was closer than you are. And I called Annie, my wife, when I, well, she was my girlfriend at the time. Um, I called her when I got out and I said, well, I didn't get that. You know, there's no way I got that because I just went horribly wrong. But then I did get it. I found out like in, in at intermission that night uh, uh, the show I was doing because it was on a Saturday. You found out that night? That night. Wow. And the thing I didn't know was who got the part. Like, did did the me doing the funny Mickey Doyle voice person get the part, or was it the just plain me that just did it as myself? And no one ever told me. I think it was the guy who talked about Ibsen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, because that's part... I mean, they obviously went with your choice, your your bold choice to do the voice. Yeah, they just but let me do there it. is also a sense, I think, with making things, especially for someone like Scorsese, is it's like this could go on for six years. This could yeah. go on for seven years. I want a guy around that I can talk to about. Yeah, could be stuff and, like. And they were so good to me. I I don't know. I don't know that Mickey Doyle was scheduled to be there for five years um, on the show, but they kept me around and. Um, well, you were quite good. I mean, well, they let me. They and they really let me do that. Not everyone would let a person be as kind of cuckoo as I was on that show. Was there ever a moment where like a different director came on and was like, "Oh, we're do this is what we're going with on this one," and everyone had to be like, "Yes, it's great. Watch it." There was, you know, there was a moment maybe three or four episodes in, and we all thought we were going to be killed off. So every and everyone knew that it was like a really good job, and everyone wanted to be on it. So we all desperately did not want to die. And I can remember Jeremy Podesta, who is is a friend of mine, was directing an episode, and he came out and he goes, "Yeah, yeah." He says, "I know you do the laugh. You have the." That there's a thing you do with the laugh and the and the and the voice and he's like let's do some where you don't do that let's try it <laughs> he said there's some talk in the back they're not sure if that's like something that should and then i they tried it and i i inevitably i must have been so bad to not do it that they were like Let's just cut our, cut our losses. And he came back and he goes, "Just do the laugh. Just just that's, just continue on." Yeah. That's so interesting. Why do you think it was so bad as you playing it naturally versus playing it this other way, which nobody else, it seems, or a lot of people around you didn't recognize was the the honest way to play it for you. But for you, clearly, you couldn't do the other way because it felt honest to play it in this. Yeah, I don't. Way. You know, I don't know. I I can't. I can't tell you. I I I know that you know this when you when you work on things. It's like it's a it's a feeling. Yeah. It's like I'm sure baseball players feel this way when they're swinging the bat. It's like when they're swinging well, it just feels right. And when it's wrong, it's wrong. And um, I don't know acting. It's like in here when it's wrong, and it's like shameful. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, and like Nowhere it's why go. actors like flip out sometimes because yeah. they're like, this doesn't feel right. Yeah. And no one is paying attention to it, kind of thing. Yeah. I can't imagine what that must have been like to be doing something so bold that felt right, and have people be like, no, do this other thing that feels wrong, but it's yeah. natural and easy. But, yeah. But I. That's okay. That's okay. It was okay. Uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question? Hi, I want to ask if you kept any costumes or props from Castle Rock. Oh, Your costumes did are I like get it? Jeans and a <laughs> what, right. Well, I have. Yeah, I, I get a little. I have some like cooler clothes in the second half. Well, you know, if I tell you that I kept stuff, then they're gonna know. Yeah, you know we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to take things, uh, but there may, there may, or there may not be a dark blue suede jacket in my um <laughs> in my closet right now um but it's hard to get stuff even boardwalk empire they gave me the hat that's all i got i had a pickle green suit i didn't get oh uh, i have to say lizzie kaplan is doing a, an amazing performance in this in this season like a really go for broke bold performance what was it like doing scenes with her she is she is the best yeah. i love her she's so game you know, the first scene we shot was the, spoiler alert, was the scene that uh, ended in an ice cream scoop in my mouth. And oh, yeah. it was so fun to work with her. You know, she's so prepared, and uh, she has been so thoughtful about who Annie Wilkes is. And not just, uh, you know, paying 
some kinds of homage to what's been done uh, by Kathy Bates, but also from the book and what uh, what uh, Stephen King wrote, and 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 she's she is she's fearless about it, you know. And I know that making big choices about where you're going to play things can be kind of scary, and I'm sure she was a little bit afraid, but she never showed it to us. She she's she was great. I mean, they all were. I mean, Tim Robbins. Yeah. Christ, and he's so tall. He's he make, humongous. He does. You feel like a baby yeah. when you do a scene with him <laughs> because he's so tall, you know, and I was trying to be mad at him or yell at him, and, you Put know, and he's so, he's so tall that you just, you you do. I was saying to somebody, it's like there's a sculptor, Ron Muick, who, who's a, I think he's German, and he, he makes these sculptures, and some are massive, you know, of people, and they're all people, and some are really small, and there's one where you're, there's a woman in a bed and it's huge, like a mother, and she's like sitting in bed. And when you look at it, you stand next to the bed, and you feel like you're two years old because she's so much bigger than you. And that's what it's like to do scenes with Tim Robbins. Well, you're not that short yourself. You're taller than me. I mean, he's he's like six yeah. five. I don't. I, he's big. He's a very he's big. He makes you feel like a little baby. Oh, uh, we had both Lizzie and Tim here for the show, and Lizzie was saying that. When she is doing scenes and on set, she doesn't like to take it very seriously at all. Like she's done, like you said, done the homework and stuff, but on set, she likes very much to just sort of have a good time, even when doing the serious scenes. Are you of a similar uh, mentality when you're when you're working? I, I am. You know, when I'm like relaxed, like I think the goal for me is is to be comfortable, to feel relaxed, to not feel like when I've tried, you know, when I've played like really serious people and I try and be really serious, you know, I feel like I just grind stuff to a, yeah. to a stop, you know, where you don't actually do anything. You're just like, Ur. and so I do, I think like having a certain amount of energy and sort of like playful, we laugh a lot. Um, I think that, um, it, 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 it sort of invigorates me. And then if you go to a place that's sort of like calm, you're still, it's still rattling around inside of you. And so um, I, I, yeah, I like that. Although I've worked with people who are, you know, I've worked, we, we were talking about Mike Shannon, you know, he kind of, he's not method, but he's close, you know, and he's kind of grumbles around a little bit when he's doing stuff and he's a genius. So, you know. Mike's not having, ha having laughs on set. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, no. I mean, I, you know, he's my closest friend. I love him. There's no one that loves him uh, except maybe his children more than I do. And uh, but no, he's not having. He's not. He's not. He's not yucking it up on the set of Waco. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering which one of your characters you've connected with the most on stage or screen. Oh wow! Um, what character have I connected with the most? Well, I mean, you know, I was probably the most similar to. I'm pretty close to that guy from House of Cards, um, and so in a way, I would say that I connect with him. But it's it, 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 it's I feel very vulnerable about him. Like when I can't I can't watch that. Like, I've never seen House of Cards, like, with me on it. It's not something I can watch. So I'm not totally sure if that's me or not. I just feel like I was close to it. But in a way, you know, people like Mickey Doyle, the, like, really cuckoo ones, like, that, I have a real, that's, like, really who I kind of am. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's something about, there's a kind of, like, uh, 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 a, a bold, sort of brash, sort of ridiculousness, a kind of absurdity. Like, I think of my life as an absurdity. Like, I'm an actor. Like, that, there could not be anything more absurd than being, like, uh, an actor. It's such an absurd lifestyle. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It, you know, you can argue that it maybe doesn't do that much good uh, or harm. That, it, in a way, it's kind of a nothing. You know, and, and, and yet... I am able to um, imbue it. For me, it has so much meaning, and I find that sort of contradiction to be so absurd. And so uh, I enjoy the absurdity of, of a character like Mickey Doyle. Are you also uh, a naturally 
as a performer, like w even when you're not on screen, like in your home, like a naturally performative person and joking around and playing? I mean, I joke a lot with my kids and I, I, I do like to tell jokes and my wife is kind of like calm down, you know, with the wisecracking. Are you, you a know, performative storyteller? Um, I have, you know, I'm streaky. You know, like sometimes I am, sometimes I'm really flat. You know, I'm like, I'm, I, I like, if I find a groove, then I could go. The but phrase it, streaky feels like it could mean a few different things. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, it, if you catch me on most days, I'm actually pretty introverted. Right. I'm actually pretty shy. Like I've, I've, I have a shyness. Were you before you came and became an actor? Because sometimes when people be take on a role of performing on a regular basis, that pulls them into being more introverted because that part of themselves that they had before is now being used, uh, you know, for their, for their work. No, I think this has always been me. I think that, like, I've been that very strange mixture of uh, the shy performer. Like, mm -hmm. I have to, like, kind of push through. Uh, there's, like, a, a, a gauze wall I have to kind of walk through in order to to be expressive and sort of out outgoing where I feel most comfortable is is hidden um, uh, behind it but because of this profession because of living in New York City where you're just amongst people all the time I think that I do um, I do uh, try to manifest uh, a lifestyle that forces me through that sort of gauze uh, wall quite a bit so that I'm forced to like be more outgoing. Well, you've chosen New York over LA, so you've already got that. Yeah. Is that, was that part of the, part of the reason? No, I, I, you know, LA has always kind of frightened me and I've always thought, oh, I'll go to LA if I'm invited, you know, like if they're like, Hey, come out and work in LA that maybe I would go out there. I love their weather and stuff, but, um, I'm a New York city person. I, I like, I like it's busy. I like to walk. Yeah. I like to. I like. I like the people here. I like. I think it's funny. I feel like LA is a lot more competitive in a way than New York. Like the actors that I know here, uh, we're a community in a way that doesn't kind of celebrates each other. Is okay with each other getting jobs. Is okay with each other having success. And I feel like. And this could be a total misread sure. of Los Angeles, because I don't really know. But my feeling has always been that in Los Angeles, um, there's because there's so many people, and there's they're fighting over things. And there's you know, in New York, there's five guys you know behind me that are as good as me and will do it for less. In L.A., there's fifty, right. and I think it makes people like behave in a much more sort of um, competitive way, and I don't find that very comfort comfortable. There's also in New York, maybe there's five guys behind you, but there's five people around you who do completely different things totally. that work in the industry. Well, well, and that's the other thing, yeah. It's like, and, and I, I do like that, and I feel like having a, having a pretty uh, spaced out group of friends that just do all sorts of things is, is a, it's a nice part of like, living in the city. I mean, I, I've lived in the East Village for a long time, and it's just a potpourri of just every imaginable person lives over there. Yeah. Uh, Paul, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Thank yeah, you man. so much for coming in. Uh, Castle Rock is on Hulu uh, right now. Paul Sparks, everybody, let's hear it.